Hey, quick announcement. I just launched a new channel. It's called Pointless Hub, a place where I talk about things that have no educational value, like retrospectives on movies and games I'm interested in, and I think you'll be too. The first video is about the show Deadliest Warrior, and, <laughs> and what an interesting series that was. So check that out if you want. All right, on to the actual video. Hawaii is unique compared to the other American states, and it isn't just because it's an island, but because it was a nation, a Polynesian kingdom that had its own unique history before ever being absorbed into the United States. Ever since the 1890s, what exactly Hawaii has meant to America has shifted over time. First, it was just another island territory used for its crops. Then it became the heart of the US Pacific Fleet. And finally today, a tourist hub. But there's always been that question. What if the US just never took over Hawaii. What if in an alternate timeline, it never became a state, and instead, the Kingdom of Hawaii remained? Well, uh, okay, that's an idea. The main question, though, is how would this have happened? Outside of just outright banning foreigners 200 years ago, which probably wouldn't have worked anyway, how would Hawaii, in an age of imperialism, remain its own nation? Well, uh, it's quite the doozy. This is the Hawaiian flag, and as you can see, it's, uh, it's got a unique feature on it. It's tea time! The reason it has the Top Gear flag on it is pretty simple, actually. King Kamehameha saw the flag when the British landed on his shores and just really liked the design. That's the incredibly simplified version. But the point is, the British Empire, ever since their interaction with the Sandwich Islands, like the Hawaiian monarchy too. They respected the kingdom's autonomy and never made any efforts to take over the islands for themselves. Except for, uh, that one time. You see, in 1843, there was a British captain named Lord George Paulette. Paulette had heard rumors that British subjects that had been living on the islands were being discriminated against by the monarchy. So he demanded retribution and demanded to see the king who was not there. Instead, the Hawaiian monarchy passed Paulette's concerns to an American, the Minister of the Islands, for Paulette to voice his opinions. This action insulted the proud Paulette, who proceeded to politely punish the Polynesians by overthrowing the monarchy and establishing himself as the new governor. He claimed the lands for Britain, and for six months, this officer, who had no authority by the British government to do so, de facto ruled. It was an action the British monarchy deplored, but for a moment, it didn't matter. As you see, the United States was on the case. By even as early as the 1840s, American missionaries had began creating sugar plantations and living in Hawaii. They had quickly become a planter class, an upper white elite that had begun their march towards economic and political dominance in Hawaii, ones that were also good friends with the monarchy. And so the United States already had a vested interest in the islands, half a century before, well, you know. And they wished to protect Hawaiian sovereignty. Since this was the 19th century, communication was slow, and so as far as the United States knew, Britain was just taking over the islands. Tensions rose, and American ships crossed into Hawaii to confront Paulette. Yet, due to some threats and some well-timed communication, no shots were fired. Paulette was eventually relieved by the British, the whole situation was deemed a misunderstanding, and there was a square named after one of the British captains who eventually arrived and kicked Paulette out. Now, this is where our divergence begins. What if in an alternate timeline, this misunderstanding wasn't simply brushed aside. What if different actions had been taken and the USS Boston and USS Constitution, in response to Paulette, opened fire on a British vessel? Now you know, mishaps happen sometimes, and an action like this in any normal era would probably have just been brushed off, or at least deeply apologized for after some tense negotiations. But these were the 1840s, and were certainly not normal times. As you see, back in North America, the United States was in full manifest destiny mode. In our timeline, the United States would wage war against Mexico only a few years later and finally have territory from sea to shining sea. This mentality wasn't just against the Mexicans or Native Americans, it was against anybody the US had a border with, including British Canada. 
In fact, in 1843, there were already two territorial disputes with Britain, one over the northern half of Maine, and the other over the territory of Oregon, a territory the U.S. very much desired. James K. Polk would even sometimes call for war against Britain over it. But by 1843, he isn't in office, John Tyler is. And I'll, uh, I'll talk about him later. In our timeline, these disputes were eventually settled, and the U.S. just went after Mexico. But there was for a few years the feeling that America was going to have to fight a war on two fronts against Mexico and the British. Which, of course, didn't happen, as nobody wanted to risk trade or fight a war over just these territories. But what happens during this critical moment? A U.S. ship attacks a British vessel alongside a captain and his crew. Happenstance and misunderstanding go out the window, and that's exactly what happens. The Americans were already viewed unfavorably by the British public for their expansion, already being seen as a growing threat. And to attack a British ship in the middle of this powder keg lights a fire, in much of the same way that we saw the USS Maine did when it exploded in Cuba. If this seems far-fetched, keep in mind the US and Britain only 30 years earlier fought the War of 1812. The British burned down the White House, and America failed an invasion of Canada. These were not the special friends we see today. And while on both sides there would be cooler heads that could prevail, like say Lord Aberdeen, who very much did not want a war with the Americans by the way, who's to say this doesn't get out of control once British blood is spilt? How does the public react? I mean, he failed to prevent the Crimean War in our own timeline, so even despite his best wishes, things can still happen. While for the Americans, justification comes from believing Paulette was operating on orders, and that the British are only lying or something. John Tyler was already openly anti-British and had vast goals for American trade across the Pacific, including by this time, planning to annex Hawaii. It would not be out of character for John Tyler to use this action as an excuse to push American expansion, even if it would be a very misguided one. One misunderstanding, one brash action, leads to war. Now let's say that a war would erupt. How exactly would it be conducted? Well, sorry to disappoint you, but it'd be in many ways like the War of 1812. Any major ground forces are deployed from Canada as the still-dominant British Navy aims to control the eastern seaboard. I could imagine enough damage would be done to American cities, and the war, if it did happen, would be unpopular enough for many that the United States would eventually sue for peace. Now, had this happened, this would damage the reputation of prominent Warhawks in Washington, alongside John Tyler. Tyler's reputation was already terrible at best. A man who was only president because his predecessor died in 30 days. And also, he took his administration in an entirely different direction. So I could in some ways imagine that, had the United States lost the war, John Tyler would just be thrown under the bus. The entire endeavor blames solely on him, and perhaps even to this day, instead of being seen as a forgotten president, he'd be embodied in popular culture as a failure and embarrassment. Anyway, the war would not go that great for the US, but after negotiations, I could imagine some disputes would be resolved in goodwill. Northern Maine probably still goes to the US, while Oregon might go to the British. Now, the reason I said all of this, is because the main result from this war would be the British successfully scaring off the Americans from Hawaii. The US is seen as at fault and should not have reacted to the situation in the way that they did. They do not own Hawaii, and the monarchy is an independent entity. So the biggest effect of this war is that Hawaii grows closer with the British, and the islands become a sore spot between US and British relations. The war for a time wards off American interests as they don't wish for another conflict. Now, this may all sound far-fetched and overly complex for the US simply not taking Hawaii, but here's the thing. This alternate war scenario is probably the best chance Hawaii had to not being annexed. And while this war in itself has its own consequences, I'd imagine the US and Britain would resume trade and patch things up over the next few decades. There's smaller ramifications, of course, but I'm not going to go into them too much as that just derailed the topic at hand. 
But all this means is that by the end of the 19th century, the US stays away from Hawaii and moves on to other ventures. What exactly would this be? What would Hawaii become if it remained an independent kingdom into the 20th century? Now, uh, I'm going to be honest with you. If you went into this video expecting Hawaii would remain the same tropical paradise and simply exist in the Pacific as a lone Polynesian nation, I've got some bad news. Even if Hawaii remained an independent nation away from American annexation, it wouldn't be in a good situation. By the time of Queen Liliuokalani, Hawaii as it's depicted in pop culture and before the annexation was already far gone. Hawaii in the 19th century was effectively a sugar state, controlled by a cabal of five sugar families, descendants of American missionaries, now turned plantation owners. The sugar industry built up Hawaii's infrastructure and controlled every aspect of daily life. It was the main economic resource of the islands, selling sugar to an American market even before its inclusion. And this profit made the white settlers into a rich upper class that influenced the Hawaiian monarchy for decades. It's why when Paulette wanted to meet with the king, he was met with an American instead. These were people who were descendants from Americans and were loyal to the US, but they saw themselves as Hawaiians. And what do plantations need? workers. Disease had wiped out their population, and they were so self-sufficient they refused to work on the plantations. So cheap foreign labor was imported. Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and Filipino labor imported to work the land, creating a caste system in a way. This was the reality of Hawaii. Even while the famous song of the queen was being written, she was saying goodbye to a homeland that had already been lost for decades. The plantation coup against her and the American annexation was in many ways a formality. They already had the power, so even in a best case scenario with the kingdom becoming protected by the British and remaining independent, by the turn of the 20th century, it'd be a sugar-based economy populated by a majority of cheap foreign labor dominated politically by white elites. Going into the 20th century, the society would be segregated even with the vast Asian majority that would exist, as race was directly tied into the workforce and cheap labor. In many ways, this would be like a Pacific South Africa, as it's very likely by the 20th century, the monarchy would have been abolished, power held with the export of sugar, and an industry that wouldn't have that long to live. As you see, sugar production collapsed in the 1970s. It'd be inevitable that cheaper markets would open up as the world industrializes. Its only resource would be vanishing. Sure, if there was some forethought, it might have expanded into tourism, but even then, being independent would only harm its potential tourism market, Americans. Americans may very well go to other islands, potentially an alternate Puerto Rico that would now be the 50th state. As for Hawaii, I'd imagine that once the sugar industry begins to fail and further worker strikes begin, the planter class simply packs up and leaves. By this point, probably in the late 20th century, Hawaii would be a lone island republic facing immense problems. Rising unemployment and a stunted tourism industry only builds on itself. In fact, even the Hawaiian culture in itself wouldn't be a draw for outsiders, as its language would have disappeared decades ago under an apartheid regime. Without the United States, the white class would have only doubled down harder on assimilating various cultures, especially if the monarchy had been deposed. So what we'd be left with by the 1990s is the poor Pacific Island nation of Hawaii, barely in the minds of any Americans, being reported on in the news as a place of civil strife and unrest, a land effectively stripped and used before being abandoned. Now there is far more to the scenario that I didn't even cover. Like the US without Hawaii most likely would have focused on Guam and the Marianas Islands as Pacific bases. Had there been a World War II somehow, it's likely Opera Harbor would have been attacked by Japan. These two territories might have eventually become states later in the 20th century. But for the most part, this is where it would be at. Even without this whole British-American war, had Hawaii remained an independent kingdom 
it was never going to be the tropical paradise we imagine in popular fiction. One reliant on a single resource until the industry collapsed and the ruling class fled. Its poor economic conditions and disconnect from the rest of the world makes it unpopular for tourism despite its natural beauty. One that might not even exist. As in our timeline, there were extensive decades of effort to preserve the Hawaii we see today. So as much as it's often talked about as how this was the moment Hawaii changed forever, and how if this moment had not occurred, Hawaii would be a beautiful kingdom, don't believe it. As soon as sugar plantations began on the islands, it was over. But as depressing as this scenario is, that's not the reality. That didn't happen. Hawaii's history has been filled with tragedies and wrongs, and yes, it isn't independent, but it at least in spirit and in culture has preserved and is recovering an identity that was once lost in dying. These small islands smack dab in the middle of the Pacific may be reliant on tourism, but in some tiny way, they at least remain a paradise. Thanks for watching. If you're still here, go check out Pointless Hub. I talk about Deadliest Warrior in the first video, but I'm aiming to talk about really anything. If you have the same taste in media as me, you might like it. Like I want to talk about stuff like Battle LA, those Emmerich disaster movies, Risk Factions, and maybe even Tiberium Wars. I'm aiming for this channel to be in the same vein as the Red Alert and Ancient Aliens videos just for anything I feel like, not just history related. So go check that out if you want. Thanks. Bye.